Can you think of anything more frustrating than losing something of value or more tragic than losing something that cannot be recovered? It's hard to believe that it's been more than two years since Malaysian Flight 370 left for a relatively short international flight from Malaysia to Beijing. 239 passengers were aboard the Boeing 777. It left Malaysia, and in within a little more than an hour, air traffic control had lost contact with the pilot and the cockpit, but they were able to monitor the fact that the pilot basically did a U-turn over the South China Sea and started heading due west instead of east on its uh, planned route. And somewhere over the southern Indian Ocean, the plane was lost. If you remember, it was a mystery at the time because it seemed like it would be almost no time before that wreckage would be reclaimed. Unfortunately, days passed and weeks passed, and there was no sign of Malaysian Flight 370 and that Boeing 777 and those 239 passengers representing 16 different nations. It's the most expensive aviation recovery effort in history. $143 million have been spent on trying to recover the wreckage and any sign of that plane. Now a few pieces of fuselage and maybe some wing parts and other things have washed up on some beaches in that part of the world. And it's presumed that those pieces are from that flight. But not one thing discovered so far has given one clue as to what really happened to Malaysian Flight 370 and the 239 passengers on board. And this past week, the Associated Press reported that after searching 46,000 square miles of the Indian Ocean, spending $143 million, mostly American and Australian money, the search has been suspended and will be officially called off before the end of the year because that plane and all of its passengers are lost. Unbelievable. It's frustrating to lose things that have value. It's tragic to lose things that cannot be recovered. Jesus told one of his most famous stories about something of extreme value that is lost but recoverable. And this morning, I want us to look at the subject, Jesus in the lost and found. Would you open your Bibles with me, please, to Luke 15? Luke chapter 15, I want us to begin reading in verse 1. I'm going to look at the whole chapter, but I'm only going to read part of it. Luke chapter 15, verse 1, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. That is, they were drawing near to Jesus. This verb tense means that this was happening over and over. It's past tense with repeated action. It wasn't just this one event. It meant that tax collectors and sinners were finding a friend in Jesus. Well, that seems normal to us, but to the religious leaders of his day, it was horrifying because the next verse says, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled. You know what grumbling is, right? That's when you're talking under your breath to the people around you about another person and you don't really want him to hear you. It's actually the word used in the Old Testament to describe how a dove sounds, the cooing of a dove. Same word. It describes a low, you know, volume conversation and they're saying, look who he's eating with, tax collectors and sinners. Well, Jesus overheard them. And verse 3 said, so he told them this parable. Now he gives them three parables. I'm going to pick it up in verse 11. And he said, 
There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country. How many of you have ever had an economics lesson like that in your personal life? When just about the time you'd run out of money, things started getting worse. <laughs> and he began to be in need. And he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. So in other words, right about the time he thinking to himself, maybe I'll just take a handful of this pig food. Maybe the owner of the pigs came around and he threw it back in the trough and acted like, well, that wasn't me trying to eat pig food. And payday hadn't come yet, so he was still hungry. But when he came to himself, now that's just an Aramaic Hebrew way of saying, he suddenly wised up. It was a moment of spiritual clarity. I want to ask you a question. Has there ever been a time in your life when you just suddenly came to yourself? In other words, you just said to yourself, why did I do that? Why did I spend those months or years going down that pathway and look what I have to show for it? It was a moment of sudden spiritual clarity when he said, look, everything I've done has led me to this point. I'm going home. <laughs> I'm going back to my father. Look at his rationale. He said, my father's hired servants, verse 17, my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, and I perish here with hunger. This doesn't make sense. I'm starving to death, looking at pig food, thinking not bad. And my father's employees are eating till they're full. This is senseless. I've made a big mistake. I'm going home. That's basically everything he just said. He said, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. In other words, put me on the payroll. Anything's better than looking at pig food, thinking, yeah, it looks pretty good. Put me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring the best robe and put, his, put the ring on his finger. Now you say, what is the deal with the ring? Why is he trying to put jewelry on him? This isn't jewelry in the way we think of wearing a ring. The ring, in this case, had the family crest on it. Whoever wore the ring had the ability to conduct business on behalf of the family. When that ring was placed in wax, it was essentially the ability to sign a contract on behalf of the family business. This boy who had squandered his portion of the wealth is now being welcomed. Come on! He's being welcomed back into the family as if he'd never been gone. That's how good God is when we repent and come home. He says, you are still greatly loved, and you're not going to be treated like an outsider we're going to give you full privileges of a king's kid when you come back to God. That's what the ring's all about. And he said, put shoes on his feet. And then he said, bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let's eat and celebrate. For this son, my son was dead, and he's alive again, was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Well, now his older brother was in the field. The older son was in the field. 
And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said, well, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. And his father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed you. I've obeyed your Uh, your commands, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But this son of yours came, who's devoured your property with prostitutes, and you killed a fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you're always with me. And he said to him, it was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this brother, this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and he's found. Now, why do you suppose Jesus told the story about the second, the older brother? I mean, the story would have been phenomenal if he'd only had one son. Because don't forget who he's talking to. He's talking to not to the sinners and the tax collectors, he's talking to the religious elite who were looking down on other Jewish people who were far from God, who Jesus was reaching out to and ministering to and caring for. And it was to the religious elite, the theologians and the pastors and the seminary professors and the Bible translators. He's talking to them, and he adds the story about the older brother who resented the younger brother being treated well by the father. And basically saying, from now on, you Pharisees, you wear the tag, older brother. Because you don't hear another word out of the Pharisees after that story is told, at least for a little while. In this passage of Scripture, Jesus is pointing out the reality of what it means to be lost and found. D.L. Moody, the 19th century evangelist, once said, if you receive him, it'll be well, but if you reject him and are lost, it'll be terrible. Now, the prodigal son, the story I've just read, is probably the most famous of all the stories Jesus ever told. In fact, it's been called the greatest short story ever written. It's got everything. It's got passion, drama, family intrigue. It's succinct. And How could you imagine a better story told in fewer words that had more relatability? In fact, how many of you, and don't raise your hand or point, how many of you have a little bit of the prodigal son in your own story? Or you're praying for one right now. There's something about this story that speaks to our existence. It speaks to our experience. There's something about many of us who could say, that's me. Well, this story is really preceded by two other stories. I didn't read them, but in verses 4 through 7, Jesus tells an exact same story about lost sheep. Remember who he's talking to. He's talking to the religious leaders who are complaining that Jesus spends time with, with sinners. And so Jesus says, well, let me straighten something out for you. Let me just clarify for you why I'm doing what I'm doing. Why do I sit down and eat with people you despise and look down on? Here's why. Imagine a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes missing. Which one of you would not leave the 99 and go look for the one that's missing? You're a shepherd. Your job is to protect and care for the sheep. And if you've got a lost sheep, you will go find that lost sheep. And if you find it, you'll put it on your shoulders and bring it back. And the reason that we have all this artwork of Jesus with a little sheep on his shoulder is from this story. The reason that the shepherds put the sheep on their shoulders is that because once the sheep wandered off, they wouldn't know where to find water on their own. They'd be exhausted sometimes by the time they were found, and they couldn't keep up with the flock. So in order to take good care of the sheep that has been recovered, the shepherd would carry it over his shoulders until the sheep had recovered enough of its strength to join the flock again. There's a tenderness and a compassion in the imagery of the shepherd carrying the sheep. Jesus said, if you have a lost sheep, one out of a hundred, you'd leave the 99, you'd go get the one. When you found it, you'd come back, you'd say to all your friends, hey, look, 
I found my sheep. Let's celebrate. This is good news. Or, he said, what if there was a woman who had ten coins? Now, just for your own sense of Bible trivia, so you'll know tomorrow and nobody else will but you, Luke loves to tell stories, first a woman, then a man. So he says there's a man who had a lost sheep, and there was a woman who had a lost coin. So he tells the story about this woman who had ten coins. And all of a sudden, she looked up one day, and there was one missing from the set. And the word coin there, you'll be interested in this, is the word drachmas in Greek. We Remember the Greek drachma or drachma? How many of you were in Greece with me that summer when it transitioned over the euro? And when we figured that out, we told the bus driver, pull over to the first bank you come to. We piled out of that bank, and we were bringing out $1 bills and buying up drachmas as fast as we could for souvenirs. Because Greece, after 2,000 years since the days of Alexander, transferred to the euro and got rid of the drachma. And look what the Greek economy did after that. It's not good. And if they ever need any drachmas, I know where I can get hold of a couple <laughs> pocketfuls. Well, that's this word for coin, drachma. It's, an, it's a, the, the Greek coin. And this woman had ten of them, and she lost one of them. And she lit a lamp, and she got her broom out, and she started sweeping everywhere. And then she said, hey, 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 look, I... I found it. And she called all her friends. He said, you know that coin I've been looking for? I found it. Y'all come on over. Let's celebrate because my set is complete again. I've got my lost coin. He said, which one of you, if you had 10 coins, you lost one, wouldn't do the same thing. And then he said, what if, what if there was a man who had two sons and he lost one of them? And then he tells the story of the prodigal son. Isn't it incredible how the stakes went up? First, it was just 100 to 1. Some of you might say, ah, you know, a penny to a dollar was no big deal. But then the stakes got a little higher. No, it's 1 to 10. This is a dime out of a dollar. And then it became something other than property altogether. He said there were two boys in this family. And one of them just decided, I'm out of here. And he started wandering off, and he wasn't found for a long time. Well, all three of these parables have the same plot. Something valuable was lost. Something, an urgent search and recovery mission took place, and then there was celebration over finding the lost thing. And why does he tell three parables in a row that mean the same thing? Because he's talking to those religious leaders who had a problem with the fact that Jesus was dealing with tax collectors. You say, well, what do you mean tax collectors? Is this like the IRS agents? And No, these are people who actually worked for the Roman government at toll booths along the trade routes in Israel. And as you are walking along these trade routes, the Romans who had occupied the nation had a booths put up where they were collecting tariffs. Like when you leave the airport and there's somebody in one of those booths and you give them your credit card and you need a receipt, you know? Well, these were Jewish people who had bid on the opportunity to have this job. They had paid to get this job. And there was no way to monitor exactly how many people came through those tariffs, through those booths. There was no way to know for certain just how much that guy was pocketing at those key intersections. And they were getting rich. And the average Jewish person was saying, look, the Romans have come in here and they're taxing us for taking a walk on our own property. And you work for them. And you're lining your pockets with the money of your brothers and sisters in order to help the occupiers. And they were hated and despised by the religious people and by the average Jew. They hated the tax collectors because they were in collusion with the occupying nation. And now along comes Jesus, and he's eating with them. And they concluded, if you eat with them, you, 
If, if, you, if you don't condemn them, you must condone them. How many of you know there is a difference? You can have a meal with a person. You can treat a person with respect. You can reach out to a person. You can go into another person's house, and you might not agree with anything they do or say. But this attitude of, hey, I'm a Christian. I can't touch you dirty people. Jesus said, let me clear something up for you folks. If a man had a hundred sheep and he had one wander off, don't you think he'd go look for the one? If a woman had ten coins and she misplaced one of them, don't you think she'd want her set complete? And if a father had two sons and one of them left, don't you think he'd want his son back? Well, that's how God feels about sinners that you despise. You see, the religious elite viewed them as unworthy and unacceptable. Jesus viewed them as lost but valuable. So here's what Jesus wants us to notice this morning. Jesus wants us to recognize the reality of lost souls. Because how many of you know this story is not about sheep or coins? This story, all these parables, are about the value of human souls. For instance, look at verse 4. He said, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lost one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And then look down at verse 8. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligent to, uh, diligently until she finds you know, that which is lost? And then look at verse 32, the concluding statement. It was fitting, this is from the words of the father in the story of the prodigal, it was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and he's found. Do you notice the synonyms? He was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. John Piper recently said, the portrait of man's lostness pervades every page of Scripture. But can I talk to you, Hyde Park family? I don't think the concept of lostness pervades our thinking much. It seems to me that we've lost the concept of lostness. We sing about it. We say, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. But we no longer really believe that people without Jesus are lost. We somehow have attributed some psychological explanation to what is basically a moral and spiritual problem. Right. We think that people that don't know Jesus just aren't enjoying all the benefits they could enjoy. We think that people that don't know Jesus just don't know how good they would have it if only they would come along and get a little bit of what we got. Or we think they got nothing else to do on Sunday, I'm not sure. But Jesus did not look at man's spiritual condition apart from God as merely a psychological disadvantage or a financial hardship. He said men and women and young people without Christ are lost. And could I share something with you? It's hard to imagine a stronger word in the New Testament than this one. The primary meaning of the Greek word for lost in the New Testament means to be destroyed completely. In fact, how many of you remember over in the book of Revelation, the devil in one place is called Apollyon, the destroyer. This root word for lost comes from that same word, Apollyon. To be lost is to be destroyed. And all through the New Testament, this word is translated in different passages to mean to perish, to be ruined, to be abolished, to be rendered useless, to be put to an end or to be put to death. Seven times this word is used in Luke chapter 15 to describe a possession no longer in the hands of its rightful owner or a person far from his real home suffering and distraught and desperately needing his family, such as the case of the young son. And Jesus called this spiritual condition in the strongest possible terms a person whose life has been destroyed by what? Lostness. And obviously Jesus is using this word to describe the spiritual condition and the spiritual reality of people who are spiritually separated from God. The first example is the lost sheep. A hundred, you're willing to leave 99 if you're a good shepherd and go after the one that's lost. The coin, the woman has ten, one of the 
coins goes missing, her set is disrupted. She goes looking for that one, diligently searching. And then finally, the story of a lost son. Probably the greatest story ever told. You have this wealthy family, a Jewish family, and one day the youngest son comes to the father and says, you know, I'm tired of living here. I'm tired of working for you. I'm tired of everything about this. There's got to be a party somewhere. Give me what I'm going to inherit anyway and give it to me now. In Jewish uh, law, the oldest son received two-thirds of the inheritance. The youngest son received one-third of the inheritance. And basically, this young son is saying, look, I can't wait for you to die, old man. So just give me what's coming to me by law. And the Bible says within a few days, he had converted it into cash because it would all have been real property. And when he gathered it all up, the Bible says, which is another way of saying he, he cashed it in, he took off for a far country, a distant land. And they had no idea where he went. And the Bible says when he went there, I love what it says, he squandered his living. <clears throat> uh, that word for squandered, you say, Pastor, I don't need the Greek for squandered. I, I, I know what it means to blow cash. You don't need to explain it to me in the Greek. I know, I know, I know. Uh, but let me tell you this, all right? I think you'd be appreciative when I have told you what this word squandered means. It's a word which describes a farmer gathering wheat or barley to separate the edible from the inedible. Part of, and it was a very low-tech process, but we're talking 2,000 years ago, they would go and they would harvest the grain that they were famous for, and they would gather it up on a high place where the wind was blowing, and they would take a pitchfork called a winnowing fork, and they would put that fork into that grain, and they would literally just throw it up in the air. I, it's low-tech. It's hard to imagine. It's an ancient, hard work, back-breaking process. But when they would throw it up in the air, the wind, even a gentle breeze, would blow what's called the chaff, the part you couldn't eat. You wouldn't even feed it to the animals. It would blow the chaff. The worthless part of the grain would be blown away by the wind. The heavier part that you could turn into flour or meal or feed to the animals, it'd fall back down to the ground. The, the word squander is the process of describing what happens when the wind blows the worthless part away. <laughs> so Jesus said, when he said this boy squandered his wealth, he blew it. He blew the cash. I mean, he had a hole burning in his pocket with that money. And then he got an economics lesson that some of us got somewhere along the way when one day he reached in his pocket and there was nothing in there. And how many of you have ever been in a situation where life goes from bad to worse? Because Jesus tells the story, he reaches in his pocket, there's no money in there all of a sudden. And he had squandered it. He just blew it. I mean, he couldn't get rid of that cash fast enough. And the Bible says, on reckless living, that word reckless, that Greek word appears only one place in the whole New Testament. It just means you couldn't be more stupid <laughs> with your money than this kid was. Luke is just bringing a word into the New Testament nobody had ever thought to use before. There's just no way to describe how irresponsible this young man had been. And then, to make matters worse, a famine came, and all of a sudden, everybody's out of work. Crops weren't growing. There was all kinds of problems. That meant other people were out of work. If there were any jobs to be found, more experienced people, maybe people who spoke the language of this country were getting the good jobs. And this kid could find one job, feeding pigs. How many of you know anything about Jewish life? You just don't have anything to do with pigs. They're considered unclean. And from the oldest books of the Old Testament, the Jews were forbidden to eat pork. They were, in fact, forbidden to even be around pigs. 
And this kid was in such bad shape that the only job he could find was feeding pigs. And then one day, before payday came, he was so hungry that he started looking at what the pigs were eating. And the New Testament calls them pods. And you know what the word is there? Carob pod. The carob. How many of you know about carob? It's artificial chocolate. We think we just discovered it, you know, but it's been around a while. It grows wild on the trees in Israel. I've seen it. It's not appealing. You don't want to eat it. You don't think, hey, Hershey's. No, forget it. (laughs) We're talking about carob in its untreated, unprepared form is a nasty-looking little brown, crusty little pod that grows hanging on trees, and when it dries, it falls to the ground. And you don't think to yourself, wow, dessert. I'm going to pick this off the ground, chew it, and it'll be just like eating a Snickers bar. No. It, people didn't eat it. Unless they were just absolutely starving to death, they might crunch into it and wish they hadn't. Have. But they feed it to pigs. It was, it was just the most worthless food. But this kid is... How many of you have ever been hungry enough where stuff you didn't like started looking good? Anybody? I don't mean between breakfast and lunch. I'm talking about I'm talking about you really gone for a while and you haven't eaten and it's like I don't usually like that but give me some, you know. Well, that boy is watching pigs eat, which by the way is not pretty, you know. There's nothing really nice about pigs except bacon. I mean, that's a good thing. <laughs> they don't smell good. They don't act good. They're pigs. They don't call them pigs for no reason. (laughs) And they're eating and just pigging away, pigging out on these carob pods. And that boy's looking going, huh, that don't look too bad. Now, you know he's flipping out. If he is looking at pig food and thinking it's good food, you know, this boy is a mess. And then the Bible adds insult to injury, but says, and nobody would give him anything. It's like the owner's like, I know how many pods there are. Don't you eat one. <laughs> Think about it. And then the Bible says he came to himself, which is another way of saying he wised up finally because he said to himself, what am I doing? My dad is a wealthy guy, a good guy, He treats his employees better than I'm living now. His employees are eating all they want. I'm starving to death. Here I am, a Jewish kid working for a Gentile, feeding pigs, wanting to eat pig food, and I can't. The pigs are better than me. He said, I'm going home. I'm going to go to my father, and I'm going to say, Father, I have blown it. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm not worthy worthy to be called your son. But if you would put me on the payroll, just, just give me a job somewhere on this farm. At least I have something to eat besides pig slop. And he's and the Bible says he arose. But you know something, friends? In every one of these stories, there's a moral to the story. Now, how many of you know that a lot of times when Jesus tells a parable, he doesn't explain it? If you're familiar with the New Testament, you're familiar with the parables. He explains some of them, like the parable of the sower, he explains in detail. But most of the parables, Jesus never explains them. In fact, that's part of the reason he tells the gospel truth in parables. Y'all with me? He said, let him who has ears to hear, hear. They then asked him, they said, why are you speaking in parables? He said, because this truth is not for everybody. This is truth only for those who really have a heart for God and want to know what's right and long to know what God desires. And if you really want to know what God wants, you'll understand the parables. 
But in this case, he explains the parable. Because he talks about the man with the hundred sheep and he recovers the one. And in verse 7, he said, after the story of the recovery of the sheep, he said, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 persons who need no repentance. And then look down at verse 10. He said, just so, after the story of the woman recovering the lost coin, he said, just so, I tell you, there will be more joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then look at verse 18. The boy says, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in danger of losing the concept of repentance because we've lost the concept of lostness. We don't know that people are lost, and we've forgotten that the way to come back to God is to repent. Not to say my culture owes me a better deal. Not to say, God, why did you make me like this in the first place? But to own up to the fact I have sinned against a holy God, and he demands one thing from me, repentance. And the word repentance is the key to ever enjoying any of the benefits of God. You will never enjoy one thing in the Christian life until you come to the recognition that when you sin, you've got to repent. You've got to turn away from your sin and by faith embrace God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way to come home. That's the only way to come back. Repent. There's nothing more tragic and being lost. Several years ago, about 25 years ago, I went to a prayer meeting up in North Georgia. Beautiful little church. The whole church would fit in this section of pews right here. In fact, two churches this size would fit in this section of pews right here. It was a gorgeous little church in North Georgia. And it was a beautiful day. I remember it so well. I drove probably 40 miles to get to this prayer meeting. And the sun was shining. It was a fall day. It was cool. The leaves were changing. You say, so what? I'm just telling you, it was a beautiful day. And I remember how great I felt to be with all these other pastors and some of the men from this church. We were going to get together and pray for revival. And people from all over the place were coming for this prayer meeting. And at a certain point, after some music and a few comments, we all got down on our knees at the pews to pray. And I was going to be speaking later on in that program, so I was on the front pew, and I was down on my knees praying. And there was a man in the back of the church, which wasn't that far away, and there were only about 35 or 40 people there to start with. And I had met everybody when I first got there. And I heard this man, he started praying for his son that he hadn't seen. He started praying for the son to come home. He started praying that his son was okay. And there was something gripping, honestly touching about this man's prayer. And I know I probably wasn't supposed to, but I looked up to see who was praying. Who was praying this prayer about this son that he hadn't seen? And he was crying a little bit while he prayed. He was probably around 60-something years old. Young guy. And after the prayer, I went to his pastor and I said, what was he talking about? What's the deal with his son? And he told me the story of something like 20 years prior to that. So this has been about 25 years now. About 20 years prior to that. When boys like to wear their hair long and dads like to wear their hair short, when, you, when a lot of young boys were doing a lot of things their fathers didn't understand. This man had a son 20 years earlier, and this son and this father were in constant disagreement about politics and lifestyle and choices, and their arguments would get heated up. And one day the son said something like, I've had it. I've had it with you. I've had it with your rules. 
And the father probably countered with something like, well, get a haircut. I've had it with you too. And the son said, I'm leaving. And the father said, then get out. And that long-haired son stormed out of the house and slammed that screen door behind him and jumped in his car and peeled out of that driveway. And more than 20 years had passed. And he never heard from that boy again. And now here he was on a beautiful fall day at a prayer meeting, praying for a lost son who had never come home, reliving that argument over and over again. And I'm sure wishing a thousand times on a thousand nights in a thousand different prayers, God, why did I ever let him go? Why did I say what I said? And here he was that day praying, God, take care of him and bring him home. I've often wondered how many times over those 20 years when the phone rang. That that father must have hoped when he picked up that phone. I hope it's him. How many times did that family sit down for an evening meal and pray? hoping that the door would open to that house and that long-haired boy would be coming back in through that door. But it never happened. He was gone. And they never heard from him again. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a terrible thing to be lost and far away from home. especially when the people at home love you and want you back. And that's how God feels about you. You're his lost child. He isn't mad at you. He loves you. He wants you to come home. Now, some of you say, well, Pastor, I'm a follower of Jesus. Amen. Me too. But some of you work with someone who's a child who's far away from the Father. Or you go to a place of recreation on a regular basis. Or you go to school with people. And listen, they're not just underprivileged because they're not one of us. They're lost. And their father loves them as much as he loves you or me. In fact, some of you have breakfast every morning with somebody or lay in the same bed at night with somebody who's lost. And God did not save you and leave you here just for you. Because if the church of Jesus Christ doesn't go after the lost, Nobody else will. The Republicans aren't going after them. The Democrats aren't going after them. The city council's not. The fire department's not looking for lost souls. The police department's not looking for lost souls. Hollywood's not after lost souls. The only people on earth that God has given the responsibility to of going after his lost people is you and me. And if we don't do it, they're going to be lost forever. I've got one question for you today. It's a simple question. Are you lost or are you found? There's no other categories in life. Are you lost or are you found?